Okay, welcome back. This is episode five of the show, and with me this week is Marlena Rowe. Marlena, thanks so much for coming. Yes. And for having us in your awesome gallery. Happy to have you here. Thanks for coming. Oh, you bet. Now look, some of our viewers know who you are, but some don't. So who is Marlena Rose? Tell us. Well, I am an artist, a visual artist who has been working mostly in glass for the last 25 years um, in a very special way, an unusual way, uh, which I can talk to you more about. But um, my works are, are known because of this very unusual way that I work. And uh, my pieces are all over the world in public and private collections, museums, hotels, all over the place. Wow, okay. Well, I like, I like glass, but like you're an artist and you could be a painter or a sculptor or whatever, why glass? Yeah, that's a good question. I, it was kind of a fluke that I fell into this particular medium. Uh, when I went to Tulane University, I was getting my Bachelor of Fine Arts and you have to pick an area of expertise that you want to focus in on. Glass did not interest me. I thought it was uh, glass blowing and I wasn't interested in perfecting a craft skill. I was more of a sculptor and a painter. Plus, it intimidated me very much because it's very male dominated. It's very dangerous and physical. So I avoided the department until spring of my junior year where I finally said, okay, I'm just gonna try it. And what ended up happening was the professor was very much like me, a sculptor who found glass. And so he taught us ways that you could sculpt glass. I mean, he taught us how to blow it, but then he said, we're gonna get that out of the way. And now I'm gonna teach you how to use glass as a medium to communicate an idea. And I thought, wow, this guy is, is talking my language. But what really happened was it clicked on many levels of my personality using this particular method because it, you know, you do everything that I like to do in this one way. So you start with a drawing, you make the mold, um, you work in the sand, so it's very much like creating a, a painting in the sand. It's physical, it's a team effort, but yet it's very personal when I'm working in the mold. So it just, it, there's an adrenaline rush and it excites me and it, it just, it's just experimental. So there's a lot of aspects that are just me and I have been excited and interested in working this way for now 25 years um, and it hasn't uh, bored me yet. <laughs> wow, okay, well, that's terrific. So I was curious about like, how did you get from, okay, I learned this in school and maybe I did some in my garage or whatever. How did you get like from there to, oh, now I'm in this museum and that collector and this collector and that show and now you've opened your own gallery. What, what's like, what's the kickoff point from, I'm learned how to do this to now I do that full time as my thing. Good question. I actually realized quite soon after learning this technique that I had fallen into a very niche and different way to do something. So for some reason, I, I'm not your typical artist. I, I have the left and the right brain going, or whatever you say, with business as well as creative. And I think that I saw an opportunity because when I started working in this technique, I was getting a lot of positive feedback, more so than with my paintings or sculptures. I was getting really great feedback. And so I started to ask the professionals in my area, in New Orleans, when I was still in school, what they thought of my work. And I listened to my professor, and he said, take good pictures and professional pictures. And I listened to him. And so I brought my work to the professionals, and I said, what do you think? And then I got my first solo exhibition with a really incredible gallery. I was not expecting that. And it was a huge success. I mean, I got with, with this gallery that was really what I thought an unattainable gallery because I wanted to just go to the best one and see what they thought. What do you think as a professional? And, you know, I just came up with that idea. No one told me to do that. And so I got with the gallery. I had my first solo show while I was still in college. 
and we sold everything and I got you know a, a write up in the newspaper it was just just a dream come true I never expected that but then after it was okay I've graduated college what do I do next there's no place that I can find readily that has this technique available glass blowers want it very clean and pristine and, and their works cool in an oven for a very short period of time where my work takes about a week to cool. So you need a lot of ovens, you need specialized facility, and I wasn't finding it. So then I decided uh, to go to graduate school because I could find it. And even to find a program that, that had this technique available was really hard. So I you know, was realizing that I, I really found something that is rare. So the good and the bad of that is how do you produce the artwork? And that's really what I was trying to do. And I went to graduate school for a short period realizing that people were still interested in the glass blowing and how to just do that craft skill. And I was more into sculpture and communicating an idea through my medium. And I was only able to do it once a week, so it wasn't really worth it. Um, but I ended up finding a place locally and I just kept pursuing him. He was a glass blower, but he had a big facility. He seemed very nice here in St. Petersburg. And he was like, what are you doing? <laughs> You're gonna make a mess with sand in my, in my studio? You know, no, no, no. And I just kept pursuing it until eventually he said, okay, you can come work here. I guess to answer your question is that I always knew that this was something special and something that I was doing well and people were appreciating, so I just needed to figure out how to do it. Right. That's great. Okay, so when we come back from a word from our sponsor, then Marlene is going to tell us about a few specific pieces. Don't go away. Well, I'd like to talk about the, this African mask wall that's over there because that is an interesting one that has its inspiration from the time that I was in New Orleans. I was very inspired by the music scene. I was very inspired by the architecture and the culture and the vibrancy of that. So obviously in art history, we reference a lot of, of African art because of its simplicity and how strong and bold the shapes are. And so I was looking at that just in art history, but then I was inspired by African art just due to what I was seeing around me in New Orleans with the music and the Mardi Gras and the masks. So back then I was doing very literal African mask type inspiration. Right. And, um, and recently, 20 years later, one of my galleries had asked me to do a, a retrospective of all the African masks that I was doing back then. And so I decided 
uh, because I've been looking at these self-lit pieces that have lighting within them mm -hmm. to do this African inspiration that I was doing about 25 years ago with the lighting within it so that it's perfectly presented. The collector doesn't have to think about how to light it. And so it's perfectly presented and it's, it was, you know, what I was doing back then. So that piece I think is, is special and unusual. It is, it's gorgeous. You want to tell us about another one? Well, the pieces behind us are the African inspiration after going to Africa. My husband's from South Africa. Yeah. And uh, we went when my children were very young, and we wanted to show the, the kids to his parents, and they were one and three. I didn't have a lot of time to get inspiration, but this particular body of work was, was my, you know, one minute looking up, getting inspiration, oh, I've got a great idea, and then running after the kids. <laughs> so these are more full figures. These are more my interpretation of um, the African figure. I saw a lot of these boys in this Koza tribe who were doing this rite of passage ceremony where they paint themselves white and they're supposed to uh, look like ghosts. And so these are my ghost totem series and um, I'm really excited by them. Gorgeous. I think we have time for one more. Okay. Pick, pick another one. Okay. So I'd like to talk about this new Buddha that uh, I just finished. The red uh, Buddha. Yeah, a lot of my work is inspired by, I mean, I could also talk about the, the um, bells. I don't know if, if you'd rather not do a religious image. Or... That's fine. Red food is fine. Let's okay. Go okay, good. <laughs> All right. So this final... I mean, there are so many. We only have a little bit of time. Okay. Go ahead. So the Buddha piece is, um, I'd say, an exciting piece on, on several levels for me. The, the glass is a recycled glass from the Czech Republic that I'm using. Most of the, the rich colored pieces are recycled glass. The process that I'm using is completely um, recycled materials. Um, and this particular one is this special red glass from the Czech Republic. Uh, red is the most difficult color to achieve in, in glass and ceramics. And um, I guess the Czech people are known for their glass um, making skills. This particular glass has real gold in it, so in certain lighting circumstances, you'll see gold around the earlobes, around the edges, or the dowels, which is pretty special. Mm -hmm. um, but this particular body of work uh, is also inspired by ancient cultures. I'm constantly looking at at different cultures that inspire me, that break things down into simplicities, bold forms and shapes. Right. So that's uh, what I'm trying to do there, is just create an, an, um, an effect upon the viewer where they feel inspired, even though there's not a huge amount of details there. Amazing, and, and it's gorgeous. All your stuff's gorgeous. Thank you so much. So, so uh, I get time for one more. Yes. Okay, so I'm a brand new artist whether I'm a painter or a sculptor or whatever, a brand new artist, I'm just like wrapping up my training, I feel like I'm creating a lot of work. What do I do? How do I turn this into making a living? I think that if you're making a lot of work, like you say, that's key. Key is finding your voice. If you found it, and it seems like you're going in a direction that is yours, and, um, is unusual. I think that's the biggest key is like, okay, so you're prolific, you're making a lot of work. Is it something that sets you apart? If you found that, then it's very important to your photographs of your work, of capturing what it is that you're doing in a very professional way because anybody who's looking at it is just seeing that picture. Right. They don't know what they're looking at. If it, you shoot it outdoors, you're shooting yourself in the foot because you're completely dispersed as the viewer. You're looking at this picture, you're, saying, you're you know, looking at the tree or the grass and it's hard to focus in on the art. You don't want any distractions when you're looking at, at the image. So really spend the time and money on good professional images. Then I would say you have to decide what your goal and purpose is as an artist. Do you want to get out to the masses? I would say to do different things if that was your goal and purpose. Do you want to be a museum quality artist um, that does super high-end work? 
I would say do something different. But the first and foremost, I think, is really finding your voice and then, you know, recording it well so that you can show it to the industry and people and potential collectors or shows or galleries and, um, you know, just have a very professional presentation. Okay. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to Absolutely. come visit with us. Appreciate it. Absolutely. And we'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>